this presentation up here. You need to pass the communion plate around. Um, so I'm Andy Gross. I'm the accident prone and absent minded chief architect from Basho. Um, I've already lost my iPhone once since I've been in London, so maybe tonight after the, the, after the party drinks, we'll be like to do it again. Um, just a little bit more about myself. I've been at Basho for a long time and started here, it's about six years now. Um, and before that, I was at Apple and Akamai doing other um, distributed system stuff. So I've been pretty lucky so far for a dude without a, a CS degree to work in some pretty cool places. Um, so this talk is really not about React or not about any particular uh, system. I'll, I'll cite some examples, mostly from uh, the history of React, but it's really about uh, distributed systems. Uh, so the title of the talk, first credit work where it's due um, is stolen from a 2005 paper by Herb Sutter, a big C++ guy. I don't know if any of you guys have read this, those with gray and hair might have seen it. I that one. Um, but it was about, 2005 was really the, the beginning of the multi core era, where chips stopped getting faster in a single core sense um, and started getting wider, and that you have, you know, instead of going through two gigahertz to four gigahertz, you get two four gigahertz cores um, in your system. And what Herb Sutter was talking about in his original free lunches over paper was the challenges that that posed for sort of ordinary developers of, of ordinary software, any software. Um, and this paper really, um, you know, sort of really got people to pay attention to the challenges that were ahead. How many of you have had to debug a multi-threaded program before. Did you enjoy How many enjoyed it? Give your hands up. Okay. <laughs> Maybe if you're, there's always one that likes that kind of stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm one of those people too. Um, how many people as part of their everyday job either debug or develop um, or operate distributed systems? So if you're on, you know, a cloud provider or whatever, you're already debugging a distributed system because the, the platform that you're deploying your code on is a distributed system. How many use a NoSQL database in production? So then you're definitely in the shape. Um, and if, you know, if, develop, or if debugging uh, and developing multi-core systems is hard, then distributed systems are you know, put an unreliable network link to a bunch of computers with multiple cores. You have a massive problem there in terms of being able to keep your head around the whole problem, all the factors that could be going on. Um, but nobody's really made a uh, call to arms like this about the difficulties uh, that, we, that we face nowadays with distributed systems. Uh, this paper, you know, really inspired a lot of people to change the existing tools that we have to cope with the multi-core era. Now we have, you know, a GDB that's not half bad um, at flipping through different threads and, and inspecting what's going on. Um, so the sort of subtitle of this paper in 2005 was a fundamental turn towards concurrency in software. Um, and I think today we're in the midst of a fundamental turn towards distributed systems. There's only so much you can do on one machine nowadays, especially when you're using some of the cloud instances. You're expected um, to distribute your software over many, uh, many machines. And sometimes it's easy-ish. Uh, you know, HTTP is nice and stateless and app server if you can you know, put a load balancer in front of them. But when you start getting to databases and when you start writing your own distributed systems in your own right, um, it can be quite difficult. And if I convince you of anything, the, <coughs> the, negative, the negative point here is that we are um, uh, pretty severely uh, handicapped by the tools and languages and everything that we use today, but I think there's, there's hope. So this really affects the entire software lifecycle design, implementation testing, um, all the way down to you know, ongoing operations uh, and maintenance. So I'll touch on sort of design first. I often say that we're in a distributed systems renaissance. All the fundamental real work, uh, you know, the, the real science, uh, academic stuff, distributed systems happened a long, long time ago. And I know that, you know, ever since there was the first, ever since they made the second computer, people have been theorizing about what can we do with many of these computers. And it wasn't until, you know, about 2008 with EC2 that it was even very easy to get two computers 
doing something together. I remember at Akamai, we wanted to test something. I had to lug Dell desktops around it on my desk and physically actually get three computers underneath there to, to play with things. And we were on the cutting edge back then. Um, so now with you know cloud computing and stuff and EC2, you can fire up 100 spot instances uh, for two cents an hour and test large, large distributed systems at scale. So I think we're all distributed systems people now. And you know, maybe a secondary goal of this is to convince people to go back and look at some of this early research. Um, because uh, people like Leslie Lamport, Edward Dijkstra, Nancy Lynch, they really figured all this stuff out in the 70s, but in a much more theoretic sense, because they didn't have access, nobody had access to large amount, uh, a large amount of systems uh, to develop. But I guess it's worth looking at why. You know, why are we doing this now? Um, in a lot of ways, we have larger problems to deal with. Um, I've gotten through this talk before without saying either cloud, NoSQL, or big data. I think I've already screwed up. And in general, if, I, if you think I'm full of shit, or if you have a question, feel free to um, interrupt me. You know, wait till the end. Um, but I think the bigger thing is we do more and more stuff on the internet. I lost my phone today, or the other day, and I was literally lost without it. Like we, if that wouldn't have happened 10 years ago. Gita can vouch. Um, I was, you know, like a, I don't even know the right metaphor, but I needed the phone because there was so much stuff on there. Um, and people have increased dependency and increased um, expectations of systems. Back in, you know, the late 90s, early 2000s, you know, it was okay for even an e-commerce site to go down for a while with the little animated gift of the guy uh, shoveling stuff. Um, but nowadays, and there, you know, people have quantified it. Amazon says that every millisecond that it takes longer to load their site, it's like a billion dollars in revenue. A year. I don't know if that's the exact number to pull in that, but it's a formidable amount of money uh, tied to a very small amount of latency. Um, so these things matter. And in order to you know, combat high latency in a global sense, you need to have many computers <coughs> close to users. Um, so, and that's only going to get worse. People are going to have less and less patience with buggy or slow systems. Uh, and the answer, really, all along has been. Um, you know, to distribute this problem for many computers for both the locality uh, and the fault tolerance benefits that you can get from that. Um, the other reason is, a lot of times if you're starting a company, you don't really have a choice. If you went to a venture capitalist today and said, you know, I need some of, I'm going to use some of this money for buying my own depreciating servers and sticking them in my own data center, well, you better have a really good reason because they're going to tell you, hell no, you're going to put that stuff in the cloud uh, and you're going to lose it. So there's really no way out of this conundrum. And uh, I don't think there should be. This is fascinating stuff, and it's a great time to be um, working in this industry. But the problem is, obviously, um, this, this stuff is really hard. And the reaction so far to this problem has been something like this. I stole this from my friends at Boundary, their website. But I call this uh, hacker news-driven development, where in response to a distributed systems problem, you just pile on more and more immature stuff and hope that throughout all those things, um, uh, somehow you've, you've sealed all the holes that, uh, that exist. And I'm not picking on any database here. The slide is picking on a certain database, but React's in there, we're as guilty as the rest. And this is immature stuff. It's a serious trade-off to go from MySQL to you know, a new NoSQL database, because MySQL has 10, 15 years on a lot of this stuff. Um, but again, we, often we don't have a choice if we want to meet the availability and our time and latency requirements that our customers or our chosen businesses put on us. Um, and if you, I, I'm not advocating you follow me on Twitter, but if you, uh, if you look at sort of the whole industry now, there's a nice tight feedback loop between industry and academia. I don't want to credit Twitter with with an on this, but in a sense it has. We, can, we have a nice, at least that show in like the UC Berkeley guys, for example, we go back and forth very quickly in cycles that you didn't see many years ago. So uh, sometimes, for some reason, people invite me to talk about, you know, what can academia do better to work with industry. I think right now we're at a really good spot. A lot of the work coming out is really cool. Um, and really cool, people are starting to publish source code with their papers. Um, so I think we're sort of in a revival um, of, uh, of distributed systems. Um, 
And because of that, there's all this uh, renewed interest in a lot of the stuff I was talking about from the early 70s before. Um, as these systems get more complicated and they become, it becomes much harder for you to keep your head around all the things that could possibly go wrong, uh, there's a renewed interest, at least uh, for myself and some people I know, of, sort of formal specification of systems. Um, meaning that you, know, you write a specification uh, and then you write a system this is full of verification, actually, but you write a specification that captures everything that the system is supposed to do, and then you write an implementation of that, and you can verify your implementation against this model and actually be certain that the system is correct. Um, that's sort of a pipe dream, in my opinion. I don't think um, I don't think that's really possible. It's still sort of a, an academic interest, and it takes a long time, and the systems are, are sort of limited. Um, in scope, but there's, there's a renewed really interest in this stuff. Um, and distributed systems tend to have this history of discovering work that was done a decade or two before, and then it gets um, pushed into the mainstream again. Um, so another thing uh, which I talk about in depth is consensus protocols, which is really the fundamental problem in distributed systems. It's, you know, how do you get multiple machines to agree on uh, you know, a certain value that goes with this key, or uh, machines to agree on, you know, that's the one machine that's going to take out this action if more than one machine doing a certain thing would be harmful. Um, that's sort of the fundamental problem in distributed systems, and if you've heard of Paxos, who's heard of Paxos? Um, that was written, or that was, the original Paxos paper uh, was written many, many years ago, 1989, I think. Uh, written horribly, if you've ever read it, uh, and then there's um, the history of, <coughs> of Paxos literature. Um, uh, I get to that in a couple slides, actually. The history of Paxos literature is equally um, unfortunate. Um, and if you look at programming languages, Erlang, there's all this renewed interest in Erlang, right? Uh, Erlang is older than Java, yet within the past four or five years, you see a lot of startups in certain sort of verticals choosing it. Databases is one. Uh, mobile gaming is another. You see a lot of Erlang use. And again, this is highly available, um, low latency applications for which downtime is literally, I mean, I used to work at a, a gaming company. And when the system was down, you could literally hear sort of a, a sucking sound with the cash going out the window during advertising, et cetera. Um, the explosion of new languages on the JVM. Um, definitely wasn't like that 10, 15 years ago. People were a little more conservative about how they approached things. And again, with databases, you see all these new, um, uh, all these new databases, relative to new databases. Um, so we're sort of in this, in this renaissance of distributed systems. Um, and in, in the process of you know, preparing for this talk and just in my job, I've gone back and read a lot of these old papers. And it's, it's sometimes amazing that you know, people could conceive of these problems years ago in just a purely theoretic sense without, um, I've always been the type to sort of go right to code and not spend a lot of time on, it, on you know, abstract uh, design, but uh, these guys had this stuff figured out many, many years ago. Um, so when you get to implementation, languages, again, uh, how many program in a functional-ish language? Scala, Clojure, Berlin. Um, that just didn't happen in the sort of object-oriented data. Even C++ has closures now. And Java doesn't have closures yet, go figure. Um, and now, finally, uh, and I'm not an object-oriented hater, but uh, it's OO is not the one end-all, be-all paradigm. Uh, people are implementing nice domain-specific languages that are very declarative and focus more on the how, or focus more on the what that you're doing than on the, the sort of imperative how do we go about actually doing it. And I think if we're going to have any hope of more formal verification, the, the, the difference, the gap, the conceptual, the conceptual gap and the, and the cognitive gap between you know, the, the what, you know, the specification, and the how, the implementation, needs to get narrower. Um, and we'll see. I, I think we're off to a good start. Um, well, what this means is that we have to make our existing tools, compilers, uh, static analysis tools, um, better and more suited to the task. If you've ever met a Haskell programmer, 
they're often very confident uh, that once their code compiles, um, that it works. And that's because so many more things due to Haskell's type system show up as semantic errors uh, in the compiler that would have slipped through in a more loosely typed system. And I'm not saying you know type systems are the answer, but maybe they could be if type systems could express temporal logic and have a notion of time um, and partial failure that the, of the type that you see in distributed systems, uh, then we might be able to uh, leverage those um, uh, to get further. Something very interesting that if you haven't checked it out, I suggest you do is uh, a DSL called Boom out of UC Berkeley. It's written in Ruby, um, and it has a sort of formal model that you write your system in, and then the compiler will tell you, you know, for all this part of your program, this 98% of your program, whatever, you know, your regular, eventually consistent world is fine. But in these couple spots, uh, you need strong consistency, and that's you know a case where you need to add something like Zookeeper or funnel stuff through a strong consistent single system relational database, or you need to implement Paxos on your own. Um, so the idea is just to get these bugs, get these it potential issues in our code bubbled up so that they appear in the tools that we use every day. Uh, because no compiler nowadays is going to tell you, hey, you have a you know distributed race condition here to potential process parameters. Sure. Did you say fluid? Bloom, B L O O N. Oh. It's an acronym for something that I don't, I don't recall, but it's um, from Joe Hellerstein's group at, at UC Berkeley. Okay. Um, and you know, any language where you can implement, you know, two-phase commit in like five lines of code and fit it on the screen, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Narrowing that gap between you know what you're doing and how you're doing it. Um, and because sometimes the need for that kind of strong consistency, uh, it can be subtle, but it's not always obvious. And I think compilers, static analyzers are the perfect place to sort of put those smarts into, um, uh, into systems. So distributed consensus, that's the sort of the, the big distributed system problem. This, I don't know if you can see it, this is just a, a screen capture of what comes up when you type Paxos into Google Scholar. And you see Paxos made simple, there's a couple of those Paxos made simple. Paxos made live, Paxos made simple, fast, and Byzantine, Paxos made practical, Paxos made war, reconstructing Paxos, Paxos made moderately complex, and Paxos made even simpler. So there's already, you can tell just from the, the, the history and the literature that, hey, maybe this thing is actually not simple, right? Leslie Lamport, the original author, you know, swears that it's, it's trivial, um, but if you corner academics and put a couple beers into them, and ask them if they really, really, can you explain Paxos to me right now? And all its weird little guarantees, nobody can. Um, so this led me to rant, and this slide is a little out of date. Uh, where's my good Paxos? I mean, how do we normally solve things in, you know, software engineering? We make a library to encapsulate um, the tricky stuff. You know, one of my biggest pet peeves is, uh, you know, in an interview, someone asks me to code a complicated problem on the whiteboard, when normally if you were actually faced with that problem in your real job, you'd just use some library that did it, right? Um, and I, you know, I understand why people ask you to do those questions, but we don't have a lot of good distributed systems abstractions nowadays. Um, a file system, for example. File systems didn't always exist. You used to write raw bytes to a block device or whatever. So imagine, you know, living without a file system. It's unthinkable. Uh, or if you had to write a web application, you had to write an HTTP server with it every time. We're very good at making software artifacts that are abstractions over complicated stuff so we can focus on what our true um, domain is. And so my argument is that you know, modern operating systems, if they're meant for the cloud or whatever, um, should have these modern capabilities implemented as abstractions in the operating system properly. Uh, VMS, um, which I'm fairly old enough to remember, had one of these. It's basically like a zookeeper thing, distributed block manager, so you could say, hey, cluster, I'm gonna enter this critical section and I don't want anybody else to, you know, perhaps corrupt this data while I'm accessing it. Um, so VMS had one of these. And if you go nowadays to the Wikipedia entry for distributed block manager, you see VMS, which is like late 70s, early 80s, and then fast forward zookeeper, so we have VMS, we don't use it anymore. And so Zookeeper is the only thing. 
And I think that even within the Zookeeper community, the, the informal tagline of that piece of software is because there's nothing else. And this gets to people don't trust, you know, version 0 0.1 of a distributed consensus implementation, especially when it means that a bug in that implementation could cause corruption of data or worse. And if people don't trust Zookeeper because it's been formally verified, the software itself, I mean, the protocol, I think, has been formally proven. They trust it because it's been around for many years and other people have already gotten bitten by the bad bugs in it. So um, it's this sort of ad hoc uh, trust in that, uh, that, that all, the, all the really disastrous bugs have, um, have been found already. Uh, I like to draw the, the comparison um, little story. When I was at Apple, my job there was to write a distributed file system to make compilation faster for their big customers. Um, so I it was on OS X, so we didn't have Fuse like, um, like you had on Linux. And I spent like a year uh, writing a loopback NFS server and twisted Python and dealing with all these horrible bugs, so much to where I basically, <coughs> well, uh, the day we shipped it, or around there, the week we shipped it, and Fuse for Mac OS X came out. And Fuse is a file, file system and user space toolkit, which allows you to very rapidly prototype and implement toy-ish or experimental file system. Um, and I had enough. I sort of quit Apple <laughs> right after I shipped it um, and promised never again to sort of go into a problem like that so under-equipped. Um, but what you saw when Fuse came out, even for Linux, is that all these interesting experimental file systems wound. I mean, some of them are, are just toys, like a file system that, you know, you can mount a 4chan or Reddit thread onto your system, and, you know, toy stuff. But you also had a lot of good um, experimentation going on. And that's what it, exactly what I'm talking about when it comes to, you know, having these abstractions enables, you know, quick uh, implementation, quick prototyping, quick feedback loops. Um, and, you know, Zookeeper's fine. But the fact that Zookeeper is the only thing, I think, points to something a little more serious uh, that we need to uh, address. This one's a little more obscure, but when you get down into the nitty gritty of developing these systems and you read a description of an algorithm in the paper, it says, you know, uh, Node writes this little bit to stable storage and no more explanation. Well, that's actually really hard. Um, Ares is the protocol, the write-ahead logging protocol that most modern databases use. You know, they, they, the transaction comes in, they commit the old data and the new data to the, to the write-ahead log and then make the change in memory and then mark the transaction with a, a log sequence number. It's actually very complicated and if you read the, the paper it's almost impenetrable. But um, this is another example of a system that uh, Arguably, we need, for example, a Paxos implementation would need reliable wolf with stable storage. And if you've ever been through file system race conditions and kernels, you know, blowing up, uh, you probably appreciate this. Um, and historically, databases have been such sort of top-down implemented things with SQL at the top, and you don't really mess around with what's underneath, that it's been hard to implement in a, in a layered fashion, sort of the Unix way of building on uh, more complex and more complex abstractions as you go to stack. Uh, I talked a lot about UC Berkeley. UC Berkeley Lab, uh, Russell Sears out of UC Berkeley, one of Eric Guru's grad students, did try to do this, sort of every part of the database has a library where you can mix and match and not have to opt into a whole bunch of stuff just to use the right ahead log. Um, it's a good start, but I don't think anybody's working on it anymore. Um, so once you start talking about, hey, okay, fine, let's write a Paxos implementation that's reusable, uh, very quickly, you find you need a bunch of local tools that don't necessarily exist. In this case, um, right ahead logs. Um, us at Basho, we've tried to provide um, some usable distributed systems abstractions. Uh, React Core is one of these. Uh, what you know is React is actually sort of a plug-in application to our distributed systems framework, Dynamo style framework that is React Core. Um, and React Core is not specific to databases. React Core just knows that, hey, there's a, you're writing an application that's gonna have the notion of members of a cluster, that's gonna have the notion of members joining and leaving the cluster permanently, and it also deals with the fact that members are also, in addition to sort of permanent membership, gonna be 
flapping up and down because you're buying, you know, cheap commodity servers and the internet's not perfect and up all the time. Um, and it's actually been reasonably successful so far. The documentation is crap, and um, you know it's in Erlang, so right off from the bat, we're limiting our audience. But that said, uh, Yahoo, OpenX, OpenX is a big ad serving company, StackMob, um, have written pretty significant React Core applications that aren't necessarily databases. Um, and I think I heard last time I was here that it's used in a couple uh, university systems classes. So, uh, you know, if you're curious about this kind of stuff, check out React Core. I shouldn't say the documentation is crap. It's just, we don't treat it as a first class product at Basha yet. Um, so it tends to lag behind. Just to sort of illustrate what I was talking about there, this little blue bar here is React Core. Um, so it does kind of all the hard stuff, consistent hashing, handoff, gossiping, what your global state is around. Um, Node Live is checking, detecting when nodes fail. Um, and the way that you sort of write an application against it, um, you write the sort of client API of your app. And the client API receives a request, a request from a user and then says to React Core, so, hey, fancy distributed systems thing, here's the request, you know, distribute it uh, among the nodes. And React Core then figures out, okay, what's the key for this request or however, we, however we're sort of sharding it. Um, Sharding is a bad word, but it didn't used to be. That's um, and then once it figures out what nodes that request needs to go to, it dispatches that to you know local nodes, and these nodes just carry out the action locally. So the top half doesn't really need to know about the fact that it's a distributed system and things are going up and down all the time, um, and the bottom half doesn't really need to know that stuff either. So the idea is, and it's not necessarily this, this simple, it would be great if it was, but the idea is that you can keep all the complexity and the hard stuff in the middle, uh, and that frees you up from having to, you know, sort of spread that kind of logic all around your, all around your code. Um, because in the past, and until back show, every time you wanted to write a new distributed system, the circumstances were just different enough that you tended to have to rewrite all this stuff from scratch. And this is the stuff that's very bug prone and takes a long time to, um, to get it. But, um, testing. This is one of my favorite topics here. Another quote from Dijkstra. Testing only shows the presence, not the absence of bugs. And this is the difference between testing and actual formal verification, right? Testing just, you know, you, you find a bug, you write a failing test for it, whatever, it shows that you have bugs, but not, no matter how many unit tests you write, you're never going to be sure that there's no latent bugs still in the software. Um, so we can prove the correctness of algorithms with proof assistance and theorem proofs and stuff, but can we say anything about an existing system? Um, and I think as long as we treat it as a black box, that's, that's impossible. Um, so this is really a design first thing. We have to sort of design for testability up front. Um, regular unit testing really is not sufficient for, for real at least. Um, you know, I think as programmers we tend to have a hidden bias towards not wanting to break our systems. Um, and uh, regular unit testing just isn't enough coverage to, for at least myself to gain any confidence about the correctness of the system. Um, quick check, however, and this is something we use very extensively at Basho, is a big improvement. Has anyone heard of quick check before? Wow, right on. Um, so quick check is what we call a property-based testing tool. So instead of writing an imperative sort of just piece of code that exercises, you know, a certain method that takes certain arguments and returns something, you know, we tend to write those things. Um, we tend to game the testing game against ourselves. Quick check, you know, instead of saying, I'm calling this exact uh, method of these exact arguments, you instead say, okay, this method takes two positive integers and returns a string, or whatever the signature is, right? And then once you've given that high level um, property, uh, quick check will generate, for as long as you let it run, uh, random arguments, you know, random parameters to those functions that satisfy the property uh, and then wait for it to break. And then when it breaks, 
it will go back and shrink down that call stack to provide you with a minimal failing case um, uh, so that you know, if it had to do some circuitous stuff to get there, it can sort of trace it down and make sure you have a minimal sort of understandable case. Um, and so, you know, when you start talking about code coverage, um, you can get 100% coverage with unit tests. And a lot of times if you have continuous integration, you can go to a little website and see, hey, you know, the coverage is trending up. But that's a very easy thing to gain. I know I used to do it. It was Friday afternoon, I didn't want to break, you know, I didn't want to do anything necessarily new. So let's try to make that web page look more green by adding tests, just treating the number as its own absolute uh, end in itself, instead of really thinking about, hey, how am I testing the system? Um, so quick check, yeah, you'll get the same 100% coverage if you had it before with unit tests, but you're covering that code over and over and over and over and over again with all sorts of different arguments. Um, and so it sort of takes some of the, the, um, the easy, the, how easy that number is to gain. Uh, quick check, at least gives me a little more confidence. Uh, one example of that is a Erlang uh, process pool library called Poolboy, and it came to pass in React that we needed a process pool and we didn't want to write our own, so we found one that looked reasonably complete and we integrated into React and we made all the parts of React use this process pool and we ran our unit tests and we ran our integration tests and everything seemed fine. Um, but every January, I think, John Hughes from Cubic comes out and he gives us quick check training and we decided to subject Poolboy to this. Um, and when we wrote some relatively simple quick check uh, properties for Poolboy, we realized that just about every single API call for Poolboy was broken in some sort of weird corner case. Not, not always necessarily a corner case, but weird race conditions, right? Um, so something that, and this gets into maybe quantum physics -y stuff, you know, if the bug doesn't get triggered, is there a bug there? Um, these are the kind of bugs that always get triggered as Heisen bugs in production, right? It's like, oh, it happened once, you either ignore it or you puzzle over it, for, over it forever and you never find it. Um, quick check does a lot beyond just simple function specifications. It can test your state machines and tell you, you know, you only uh, see this bug when you enter the state machine with the, this type of arguments and then you time out and, you know, you can go many steps, I think, further than, you know, we can keep in our head during a debugging session. Um, another way of, uh, of exposing these sort of Heisen bugs is a tool called Pulse that sort of comes along with quick check. Um, and that basically changes the scheduler uh, in Erlang to do these very pathological scheduler traces that are possible and probably only likely under severely degraded sort of production systems that are heavily loaded and stuff and be hard to reproduce reliably in a, in a testing situation uh, and then sort of immediately um, surface these bugs. I won't go through what those trace means, I'll just tell you that the, these lines reveal messages out of order. If you're curious, it's React Core Q number Q98. Um, and so now, now that we've you know, instrumented this, our, our instrument React with this stuff and have these tests run after every check-in, the level of confidence that we have um, uh, for releases and stuff goes, goes up pretty far. Um, and again, this is not uh, formal verification. This is not, you know, exhaustive state space exploration, but um, in terms of how I can sleep at night, you know, knowing that Quick Check ran a million times against my software, uh, it's definitely an improvement there. Sort of an aside, a lot of famous distributed systems people, Dijkstra and Lamport at least, somewhere in the career they sort of quit distributed systems and get into formal verification methods. And after, you know, six years of trying to ship a bug-free REAC, I can sort of understand why this becomes sort of the issue in people's minds after a while. Not comparing myself to either of those gentlemen. But, <laughs> um, but there's still some problems. Um, quick check is complicated. It takes time, it takes training, it takes a real investment. Um, and as long as your code is evolving separately from your tests, what tends to happen is someone spends a lot of time writing a quick check property, quick check model for a certain part of the software. And then as long as that quick check passes, nobody thinks about it. And then, you know, a year later, you change, you change a function signature, you change the API some way, and the test fails. And then someone, it's usually around release time, someone does the least amount of effort, 
you know, just to get that test passing again, but not with that same original investment. So the code, the, the tests, as long as they're separate from the code, uh, tend to decay over time, and you become less, uh, you know, they, they tend to give you less certainty because they're, you know, the, the software has progressed. You want you start to question, you know, how much were we actually testing because this thing hasn't broken at all, or maybe it should have. Um, so yeah, take a large uh, upfront effort. We've actually at Bachelor tried to address this. Um, one of our guys, Joe Bomb, said he's J Tuple on Twitter. Uh, wrote um, a paper, I think it was for an Erlang workshop called Hanse: Property-Based Development of Concurrent Systems, where instead of having the, the model or you know having the tests and the code separate, um, you just sort of annotate your actual code in an attempt to sort of unify the tests. And, and, the, and, the, um, and the actual implementation so that you don't have that separate uh, sort of decay happening. Um, and there's actually tools that do this. I think they need a lot of work to become friendly to your average developer. This stuff is way over my head. Um, uh, but I think people are thinking about this stuff and making progress. Um, there's a thing called MC Erlang Model Checker for Erlang that um, that actually does exhaustive state space exploration. Uh, so after you've run that, you can be sure that it's actually tried every single combination of arguments <clears> and come out schedule. Sure. Generally, the problem with model checkers is that they don't terminate. Yes. Yeah, you can't be sure that they terminate. Um, and even more superficial, but but relevant, I think, is they they all have that sort of whiff of academic software to them, right? Where it's just a pain in the ass to build. And that those those things are important. Um, uh, and who knows if the model checker is right, right? How do you model check the model checker? So it, I don't know, there's, there's, uh, there's a chicken and egg problem and there is, um, I just don't think it's ready for, you know, your junior developer to, or if it's worthwhile training your junior developer to, to learn, go quite that far yet. But I think quick check's a nice compromise. Um, but you definitely need to build some sort of local expertise. Um, so the group I was in, oh sure. Can you say that in EncryptCheck we use CI process? Uh, so we just have, so now that we have a CI process, you know, we, every time we check something in, it'll kick off a build on all the platforms we support and, you know, our regular sort of make file implication will we'll run the tests. And so how quickly, how many do you feedback? Uh, it, uh, sometimes these things take a while. So quick check, you know, when we're developing something, someone will let quick check run overnight, right? And it'll tell you how many test cases it generated. For the for the integration tests, the we we prune that number way down so that we're not we're just waiting forever. But I mean, I think running checking the React if you've just checked out React from source and wrote make test or checked all the different apps and subsystems, you'd, you'd be spending a good 20, 25 minutes waiting for that to finish. <laughs> So it's not it's not immediate, but um, then you have to layer policy on top of that where you can't merge to a certain branch that has stricter guidelines without this information. Uh, and I think we intend to open source some of our CI stuff or some of our you know testing stuff when we get around to it. Um, the group, uh, myself and Justin Sheehy, our CTO in Akamai, was uh, I guess it was DevOps before you called it. DevOps. Um, it was a small group responsible for writing software that deployed our big production network, which at the time was 25,000 machines, um, which was a lot for 1999. It was nowhere near uh, the largest deployed distributed system nowadays, but for a while it was. Um, so operations is sort of near and dear to my heart. This is my friend Cliff Moon. Oh no, that's not Cliff, this is Zach. Uh, book I would pay a lot of money for, debugging distributed systems, determining what is F and why. <laughs> um, so, how do we debug distributed systems? Better yet, how do we avoid debugging distributed systems? Because, in a certain sense, once you're, you know, with a multi thread program or distributed system, once you're debugging it, you're already screwed. Um, so, how do we get, how do we monitor distributed systems? Um, and if you look at, and, and what that sort of standard monitoring approach today is, you know, you have these discrete variables, you know, 99 percentile latency for this metric, and so on. Um, but if you go look at like a post-mortem for like an AWS outage, very rarely is it just one thing that went wrong. Usually it's many 
uh, systems conspiring together in ways that you never uh, foresaw that they would interact to screw you and rather than just one variable. So we need a way, instead of just graphing every single little state variable in our system that seems to make sense, we need a way to sort of open-endedly look for these emergent properties of systems when you start to um, put them together. And the current open source options, at least from what I can tell, all kind of suck in one way. This is, maybe somewhat ironically, a SQL, uh, but this is something you could type into the Akamai query system. Um, and if you look at it, it's fairly obvious what it does. Maybe you can't see it, but it's basically selecting all the machines where the role is a DNS server, uh, selecting all the IPs and processes where the resident size of the process is greater than 75% of the total memory by doing the standard sort of sequelish join on these things. Um, and then reporting back the IP, the IP process name, the resident size, and the PIP. Um, and we're, we were able to do this not because we foresaw that we'd ever want to do this query, but because we reported fairly simple information about every process. Um, and then, you know, exposing it in this manner makes it possible for anybody at the entire company, without having to open a ticket, or without having to write it hard-coded in the software, or even in a config file, to, in an open-ended fashion, sort of look at this, this data in whatever way um, you want it to, uh, after the fact. And the way that we got alerts was, every time this query returned any rows, somebody's pager would go off, whoever was responsible for the query. Um, so if anyone, everyone were to write this, open source or whatever, I don't know, you make, a, you make a ton of money. If you want to, let me know. Because um, I haven't seen anything quite this crisp uh, since I left off. Um, just speaking a little bit more about emergent properties, stuff that goes wrong that you never really plan for, this is one of our favorites at Basho called TCP incasts. Who's ever heard of that? Yeah, it sucks. Um, Scott Fritchie's grandfather had the, had the greatest quote, so I hear this is Scott Fritchie related to you can't pour two buckets of manure into one bucket. And that's basically what happens with TCP and gas. Um, and this is just a problem that's not unique to React. I think HDFS and other systems where you have this many-to-one messaging aspect uh, will suffer from it. Basically what happens is, in, you know, in React we have a coordinating node, and it sends the request to many replicas. Um, and in the normal state, all these replicas tend to reply at about the same time. And then the switch port if the, lar if the uh, results are large enough, you, the switch port doesn't have room uh, to buffer at all, so it's got to start dropping Ethernet frames. Um, and then TCP's flow control, congestion control mechanisms kick in. And the end result is that on like a 10 gigabit network, you can see down to like one, two megabits actually realized throughput. Um, and this stuff happens in such a tiny window that uh, unless you knew about TCP incast before, which we didn't at the time, uh, you wouldn't be suspicious of it. Um, so this has been us in a lot of places, um, and it costs money. Now, whenever we hear throughput collapse, we know, we know about this. Um, there's ways to fix this. It's sort of a design tip. Um, anytime you can send a hash of some data, rather than all the data, then you do that. So what we, should, we, what we should do in React is send, you know, when those three replicas send the results back, have only one send the data, and have the other two send hashes. Um, and only then, if the hashes are different, do you need to do that second round trip to reconcile all the data. Um, and that turns out to be a good trade-off, because in the normal case, when everything's going well, um, React actually, you, you see regular consistency out of it. Um, so it's a fair bet to do this. Cassandra actually does this right, and we don't. It's my honesty for the day. Um, and then, somewhat finally, I'm almost there, um, on teaching. This is sort of near and dear to me because um, they don't let me write production code at Bash anymore. They, I'm, so, I was so good at, uh, I'm such a good engineer, they made me a sales guy. Um, no, that's not true, it's sort of just something that happens. But uh, selling is, in, uh, when you're selling these sort of new systems like this, in a lot of ways, selling is teaching. Uh, and the better, uh, more, you know, easily you can teach something, the shorter your sales cycle, the more money you make. Um, and so then there's the issue of, you know, is Paxos really that complicated? I said, you know, we, we need to look at Paxos. There actually is one. Uh, it's, a, it's a protocol called Raft, 
that turns out to be equivalent to Paxos, developed at Stanford. Uh, I met the kid who did it, nice guy. Um, uh, but it's much easier to explain. Uh, you know, there, there's maybe some tension sometimes between being able to explain things in a way that's amenable to formal proofs and being able to explain things in a way that's amenable to actually implementing them. Um, so, how complicated are complicated things really? Uh, how much of that complexity is necessary complexity and how much, you know, could be factored away by, by um, explaining it in a different way? Um, so, I'll, I'll end with uh, one of my favorite stories about Richard Feynman. Um, who remembers the connection machine? The connection machine was one of the first massively parallel computers. Um, I don't think it had many applications outside of the NSA, spying on US citizens. Um, <laughs> like, like most you know, technological innovations, the spies tend to get it first. Um, but it was a very cool machine. It had 64,000 relatively big processors and a big grid message, you know, they could message each other, and it was good for simulations and, you know, massively parallel, embarrassingly parallel problems. Um, so Danny Hillis, one of the guys uh, who founded Thinking Machines and made the connection machine, uh, was talking to a friend at Stanford, and his friend said, oh, hey, I got you an intern for the summer. Uh, I'm sending him out to talk to you. Turns out the intern was Richard Feynman. So he was like, shit, what do I do with Richard Feynman? Um, so after like a couple of weeks of Feynman sitting around and like painting the walls and uh, going to the store for snacks and stuff, they finally found a use for him, which was to uh, basically analyze the message routing functionality of this 64,000 chip beast uh, in order to determine how much memory in the buffer space they needed on each switch to you know sort of fully utilize it. Um, so they let Feynman go with this for the summer. Uh, and he came back, and instead of sort of a, what a computer science person would expect, which is, you know, inductive proofs and uh, case analysis, he came back with just like a very short, elegant-looking list of partial differential equations over like the thing, uh, values like the average number of ones in the address buffer. Um, and so Danny and all the other thinking, computer science guys are like, you're smoking crack. Um, Feynman said they needed, they needed five memory buffers per chip. Danny said they needed seven. So they're like, you know what, we're going to ignore you. We're in the same ballpark. You know, you're kind of bad shit anyway. Um, so they called the factory and said, make us these boards with seven buffers per chip. Um, and then they, the, the manufacturer calls back and said, we can only fit five, not seven. So like, all right, <laughs> well, Feynman, you said this works. Um, uh, we'll do it with five. It's your ass if it doesn't work. And it turns out it does. Uh, and the point of that whole, you know, anecdote is that, you know, sometimes I think we need to look outside of our own little silos and try to find better ways to explain things. Computer science, and especially distributed systems, are very, very young disciplines when you compare them to the rest of science altogether. Um, and I think that, you know, if you look at academics, academic papers, they all cite within their own narrow thing, uh, their own narrow sort of domain, and they don't cross-site other disciplines. So I think if you look at things like game theory, computational sociology, biology, there's probably in there a future of sort of distributed systems literature that has a much more accessible uh, and easy to understand natural explanation than some of the sort of Byzantine ways, no pun intended, Byzantine ways we've, um, uh, we've come up to explain this stuff. So I think, you know, there, there's some very uh, interesting work ahead in trying to nail some of these down, these things down, um, you know, more inherently understandably, because um, consensus seems like a simple problem when we look at it in human terms, right? It's, if you need to get people to uh, to agree on something, like you know, they might not be they might answer their phone. Uh, you know, you got to get a quorum of people. It's all very natural. Um, so I think we're we're just at the beginning uh, of a whole bunch of interesting uh, outcomes here. So. In summary, uh, free lunch is over. It's not that we ever had a free lunch, really. Um, and it's really a cool time to be part of this community. Um, I think the, the next 15 years um, will be probably some of the, um, the most interesting in terms of realizing some of the problems of the program. And to the extent that we have influence over this stuff, let's sharpen the tools that we have uh, and make them better, make them suitable. Um, for the challenge that we have.
Um, I want to thank Erlang Solutions and Triforce for having me. One note, this is a little self-promotion. React CS 1.4 came out today. React CS is our S3 compatible uh, distributed object storage uh, platform built on React. It's open source, Apache 2. Um, and we just came out with compatibility with the OpenStack protocol, so you can drop it in your OpenStack deployment and have it look just like Swift, except much better. Um, so thanks. I'll take any questions uh, people have. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, when you said that Cassandra does a buffer and does a React, does that mean you're going to fix it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Would <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, uh, you repeat the question on me? Oh, sorry, yeah. Cassandra, so Cassandra does, uh, sends hashes instead of full objects. Uh, and sending full objects can cause TCP and CAS. Uh, to, be, to, to clarify that a little bit, uh, the objects have to be pretty big probably above our recommended object size to really run into it. Um, but yes, that's absolutely something else. We just try to be honest whenever someone does something better than us. Mm -hmm. You had a question back then? Uh, yeah, on form and specifications. Yes. Um, I hear that uh, Basho uses Z or maybe you've experimented with Z? Yeah, so we have, we've, we've played with a couple of proof assistants. Um, my experience with them is like, you know, they're, they're, they're helpful, um, but the, the, our experimentation with them has been pretty academic and, and cursory at this point. Um, uh, they would need a lot of work, and we would need to do a lot of work making our system amenable to some sort of fault verification, including perhaps rewriting in Haskell because all these tools, for some reason, are written in Haskell, um, or OCaml or something, languages that aren't Rios language. Um, but we're always looking in that direction. Again, Joe Blomstead, the Hansei H-A-N-S-E-I paper, uh, pretty much represents the, the Basho state of the art with regard to going into that sort of formal verification direction. So what was the name again? Uh, Han Hansei, H-A-N-S-E-I. Perfect. Um, the search for Hansei Erlang. It'll get you the Can you just explain again why you used Erlang to start with? Oh. <laughs> You want the you want the real answer, or do you want the, the one that sounds good? Um, no, that's because the, the truth is a little bit of both. Um, it's a language probably with the best history of implementing high uptime, uh, latency sensitive, you know, soft real time systems. Um, and Justin and I were really into it when I started. So <laughs> it comes from the telecom world, though, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, we had both gotten some exposure to it at our jobs immediately prior, both of our jobs, separate jobs, immediately prior to Basho. Um, and really, it was sort of a perfect storm. The Dynamo paper had just come out, just starting a company to write some databases, and we were both into the Dynamo paper, and we said, hey, you know, all these state machines, the, you know, all distributed systems in general, they're often described as these state machines. And, it, and the, again, the cognitive gap between reading those descriptions in a big, thick textbook and implementing them in Erlang seemed, at the time, at least, to be narrower than, say, writing it in Java or C++ or whatever. Once you account for all the sort of accidental complexity of the system and user friendliness, then you know it drifts apart. Um, but uh, still a good choice, I think. We and I think I think Justin actually just wrote a blog post on our blog five years ago, right, where he goes through and sort of takes score five years on, and definitely still comes out in our mind's favor. Is it because the telecom background of Erlang is um, specifically to solve that problem with distributed systems? Yeah, I mean, the, the Erlang just has the perfect sort of feature set, the immutability and the, the sort of actor model, um, uh, and the ability to, even though we don't take care of, we don't actually use the hot code loading in React. Um, so you're trying to solve similar problems? Yeah, definitely very similar. You know, low latency, high uptime, um, what's our what was our priority? Java Java was out the window because of the stop the world garbage collection. Although I hear that's that's not bad. But we need to start that something with that whole kind of heavy GC we we have the, the latency. Right. Cool. Well, oh, on the subject of uh, consensus, you, you said uh, there is kind of a lib lib access and it's called RAND. Yes. But, 
I read the draft paper, I sat there on this, but I think I correctly uh, came out in May. Yeah. So you're comparing this to uh, battle tested. Right, right. So uh, it's. Zookeeper, it's, which is the Paxos. Yeah, so Zookeeper, well, Zookeeper is. So if you're in Java, maybe you could use it as a Paxos. You can use it as a service, which is, I think, different than a library. The question was about um, Raft, this new consensus algorithm versus Zookeeper. I think more interesting is the fact that Raft's number one stated goal in the, in the actual paper was understandability, um, which I think is new for any computer science paper. Um, there's an implementation of Raft in, um, that's the Stanford project called RamCloud. Uh, the actual um, implementation I'm talking about is called Log Cabin. It's, RamCloud has many, many components. Log Cabin is the one that has the Raft protocol and state machines that implement a distributed law, consistent law. Um, so I, I mean, I'm, yeah, I, I'm sure that Raft implementations have some bugs. I'm sure that like, if you were to stand that up for a zookeeper, you'd probably find some bugs. But that's what's And I think the, the focus on understandability was interesting. I think they go ahead and detail that plus thing. They did. Yep. Which is more than Paxos for doing that. I think that on a long enough timeline, you know, um, we'll be fine. And, and for academic C code, if Diego ever watches this, I'm sorry, Dan. Uh, it's actually pretty good. Uh, so I'm not sorry. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty high quality stuff. Uh, interestingly, though, they can't seem to get the paper submitted to a conference because all the referees say it's too close to Paxos. It's not novel. And, and meanwhile, like, if you look at the sort of the industry community, people are there, there's already like 17 implementations of Raft and name your language, uh, but it hasn't been deemed novel enough to get into like an SOSP conference. So that's, take that for what we will, that's different priorities. Cool, well, sure. Uh, sorry, excuse me, the no. question is relevant. No, 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 I'm not, I'm, I'm, as a, as a person who is working with Erlang day to day, do you have any opinion about Elixir language? Oh, this is where I'm supposed to say something controversial. Um, I actually haven't, I haven't played with Elixir that much. I definitely applaud, um, I'm, I'm, I've always been sort of a language geek. I, I like, you know, I, I'm not going to come down hard on anyone for writing, um, writing their own language. And it seems, like a, just a, a brief look at the syntax has seemed cool. I have friends with strong opinions about it. Um, and I think the main one I've heard voiced is uh, the fact that it glosses over uh, the, uh, the way Erlang does assignment and lets you sort of have the appearance of mutable state, mutable variables when you, when you don't know to do it. And I, I don't know if that's bad enough to condemn it or not. Um, but I, I think it looks very interesting. I'd have to play with it more to, to have a strong opinion. Thank you. But you don't have to look far for, for someone with a strong opinion. It's just not me. <laughs> I missed the first part of your presentation, so I'm not going to ask you to So you obviously you're presenting access from consistency and all the rest of it. Uh, yeah. Is that a bit more version for you guys then? Or for a bunch of you want to measure the system well? Well, is it really much yeah, so the question, was, the question was, I guess, sort of what, is, what does Bashel care about strong and strong consistent? So we do, actually. Um, we have, so React 2.0 is coming up relatively soon, and React 2.0 will have single key strong consistency. In other words, like right now, you can write in regular eventually consistent React. You could write something uh, and then get a timeout or an error back, but actually then go read that value depending on how bad the failure was. Um, Regular, uh, so regular React does that. Strongly consistent React, you'll be able to mark maybe a bucket as strongly consistent, uh, and then have basically a compare and swap primitive, or just the consistent write uh, capability, where either you wrote it uh, or you didn't. You don't have some of these partial failure cases that you can get into with regular sort of Dynamo, sloppy quorum. Um, and so the goal is, you know, you, you can implement richer data types using the strong consistency, like a map or a set. Um, but then we also have 
CRBTs um, so you have this nice sort of spectrum of, okay, here's eventually consistent with rich properties, rich data types, and strongly consistent allows you to do the same stuff. So it um, sort of fulfills the promise that, I think in the beginning we all thought those Dynamo and RW knobs actually could get you to strong consistency when they can't. Um, this, I think, gives people a nice spectrum of, you know, um, eventually consistent to strongly consistent. My only hope is that people don't choose the strongly consistent stuff because it's easier and then miss out on some of the greatest parts of REOC, which is the availability. But again, that's an education. One more? Yeah, no, oh, absolutely. Uh, REA PG. What's that? REA PG. Oh, that's, that's Chris. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Not in production. No. Is there a, is that purely a side project? Or is that that's, that you, uh, that's a side project, not in anything. In React PG is talking about a paper um, and a project one of my coworkers, Chris and Kojan, wrote. Um, that was, I think, to experiment with what kind of guarantees you could provide in an eventually consistent system, you know, and looking at the failure modes of, of GPROC, which is an existing Erlang process registry thing. Uh, Gen Leader is, we use it in our enterprise stuff, but I think once we have strongly consistent React, we'll replace it. Uh, that's sort of the, the weak link, I think, in some of those. But no, to, my, to the best of my knowledge, it's not using anything official with Dasha, but probably some, some side projects. I just imagine if anybody doing Yeah, no, I, I, I took a look at it, it looks cool, um, but I don't think we've used it yet. And it's a sweet entry into React Core. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Cool. Well, thanks, everyone. Enjoy uh, the rest of your night. Have a